So I was supposed to do a debate tonight, and uh, that fell through. But uh, I still want to do something, I guess, for uh, for the fans, since there wasn't any stream this weekend. So I thought I would flesh out this position on uh, race and in the context of America and how to proceed forward. And I think that there's plenty of people that get stuck in this. Uh, you know, either you're a white nationalist or you're... Uh, quote liberal on race or take the liberal position on race and I think there has to be some sort of middle ground here and what exactly that is I'm not 100% sure what it is uh, but uh, there has to be some kind of alternative to white nationalism uh, but it still is not denying of race so uh, I've been interacting much more with uh, the crucible and uh, BPF, Andrew Wilson, and his overall position on race. And uh, this isn't me talking behind his back. I mean, I would gladly say this to his face, but I mean, I strongly disagree with this position of a total uh, race denial, you could call it, um, or saying that race is just a category of the mind. And I think this is something you really just can't ignore. And I'll go into why. So, uh, it really comes down to, do you believe that there is a difference in races? Is there an IQ difference, a behavioral difference, just, you know, some genetic difference? And if this is anything other than zero, there's going to be a problem, you know? And uh, just to preface this stance, um, I think I made a video a while ago that was kind of I don't know, a, a little bit uh, under-researched, right, where I just sort of did some basic Googling and said, you know, you can't just fully write off this socioeconomic, fa I mean, you, you can't write off race uh, differences due to socioeconomic factors, because you can just look at, you know, uh, the poorest white neighborhoods versus the richest black neighborhoods, and you still see these problems. And uh, ultimately, if you're not seeing the pattern, I don't really know how to help you. I mean, that, we, this is a much longer uh, uh, argument that you could have, you know, uh, is there a difference between the races, uh, blah, blah, blah. But I'm saying if you take the stance of yes, and I don't believe that there is, at the very least, there is not sufficient evidence to prove otherwise, meaning that the common sense position would be that these people that evolved under drastically different circumstances, and we see behavioral differences wherever they go, right? Where anywhere where there's white people versus anywhere where there's black people, or you know, even add in Asian people, there are similar behaviors around each of these groups, no matter what continent they're on and where they move. There's certain patterns that we see, and the most common sense position would be to say that race has something to do with it, maybe isn't the 100% factor, and even race realists will not say that it's a 100% factor, they'll say, you know, uh, uh, J.P. Rushton, who I love to quote, he said it was at most 50%, and then the other 50% would be these socioeconomic factors, but even if it's 10%, right, even if it's anything significant, well, this is what's going to happen, right, if you have a purely meritocratic society, you're going to have a disparity as to who is in positions of power, who is in positions of authority. And uh, this is going to be even more exasperated by the fact that, uh, uh, exaggerated by the fact that y if you have a majority of the population that is white, and this is going to have a higher average IQ than a very small segment of the population that is black, that is going to have a slightly lower IQ, well, that means that the pool of people who are, you know, IQ outliers within the black community is going to be a very small, absolute number. And then the, the number of, you know, genetic outliers and IQ in the white population is going to be a much, much larger number in absolute terms. Uh, so not just uh, relatively, but very much so absolutely, just due to relative population size, to the point where if you had uh, a purely meritocratic system that brought people into power and authority uh, without things like affirmative action, you're going to have a ruling class that is looking very, very white. And this is something that cannot possibly be avoided, once again, if we 
one, take for granted that race has some bearing on a person's IQ and capacity for success. And two, we have a fully meritocratic society. So if those two things are true, like I would assume uh, someone like Andrew would want, he would want to live in a society that is meritocratic and does not uh, you know, choose people for certain positions uh, based on anything other than their uh, capacity to do that job or position. Um, you're going to have a racial disparity. So how does this manifest in reality? Well, uh, it's going to look kind of like what we have today, right? You're going to have, you know, this so-called, well, the, the liberals will call it white supremacy, the fact that, you know, many ruling institutions are majority white. Uh, and this is going to create racial tension. You know, if you are a minority in a country and you are told that you are equal in every way and there's nothing holding you back except uh, societal pressure and it has nothing to do with, you know, just the uh, chance of a genetic outlier and IQ being from your race. If that, if you think that that chance is equal, then you should have perfectly uh, equal or proportional representation within all of these institutions. So, you know, uh, if black people are 13% of the population, you'd expect to see 13% of uh, CEOs, 13% of congressmen, 13% of uh, I don't know, bankers, <laughs> they would all be uh, uh, black, right? Uh, and if you didn't see this, well, if you are told and you buy into this thing that we are all equal and there's no genetic difference, there is no explanation other than white supremacy, right? So as long as we keep fighting this untruth, or as long as we keep... Um, bowing to this untruth that everybody is the same uh, obviously there is going to be racial tension there is going to be racial conflict so in this way you cannot uh, just explain away race right so if people uh, try to say that you know race doesn't matter or race doesn't exist well maybe race as a social construct doesn't exist but uh, the genetic differences in potential between European and African descent peoples does exist and therefore it is going to manifest in a strong disparity at the high levels of these ruling institutions and it was going to be called white supremacy so how do you deal with that <laughs> so there's really no way to combat this uh, so we need to find some way other than explaining it away but then other than just saying, well, let's just get rid of all the black people. <laughs> like, obviously, that that is not a viable political solution. <laughs> you can't just expel these people from the country that call it their home uh, in a you know pragmatic political way. I mean, and I think a lot of the white nationalist explicit types, you know, they'll even tell you. Oh, well, that's okay, because there is no political solution. The only way this works is through uh, war, secession, etc. But if we are going to attempt at a political solution, we need to have some sort of plan going forward. And that plan cannot be race denial, because regardless, there are going to be disparities that arise, and it's going to be blamed on white supremacy, <laughs> and therefore... Uh, you're going to have to institute things like affirmative action, blah, blah, blah that are inherently anti-white and anti-meritocratic. So you're going to put people that are less qualified into higher positions and expect your country to function just as well. I mean, you're starting to see how affirmative action has kind of just ruined all of the bureaucratic systems of America. I mean, I kind of refer to this as the, the DMVification of the country. Uh, just nothing runs smoothly, nothing runs well, is because you have all of these uh, affirmative action hires in these uh, positions that don't necessarily belong there. And I know that's kind of a, an oversimplification, and there's many more factors than that, but to say that this isn't a factor, I mean, you, you'd have to be pretty ignorant. So, going forward, what is our possible alternative to white nationalism and race denial? Well, I think we can meet somewhere in the middle and it's going to start with 
strong protections for uh, people who identify as white. It's sort of a, a, almost like an anti-CRT, right, to, to the point of you have like a pro-white school curriculum, a, a zero-white guilt school curriculum that fully recognizes that this for this country for the the majority of its history was a white majority country and inspired by you know white european culture white european religion and this is another thing that people say they'll say oh well christianity is actually a universal religion well that might be true in the philosophical sense but historically christianity is a white religion. It's the the center for Christendom has always been in Europe, in Rome, uh, and to to say otherwise, I think is is another you, you know your your rationalization. You're you're rationalizing that away. Uh, but no, you, Christian identity and white identity are I- I- inherently related and historically related. And I don't think you can really separate them. And that's something that is a problem with the white nationalists. They'll uh, say that Christianity isn't important. Well, well, I think it is very much important because for the past 2,000 years, this has been the single uniting factor of European culture. And uh, something that, you know, is universal among Europeans, even though, you know, as we've seen in the past 2,000 years, there has been plenty of conflict, but they all sort of agreed on a base morality, which is extremely important. And, uh, uh, but then on the other hand, you have the, the people that think that it's exclusively a Christian thing, and that Christianity can be separated from uh, whiteness, I suppose, or, or Europeanness, which to a, a certain degree, it can, but who is really bearing the torch of true Christianity, right? I mean, I would say uh, plenty of black people and black communities identify as Christian. I believe percentage-wise, you have more black people that identify as Christian in America than white people, but who is ultimately acting Christian? Because even secular atheist Christians, what they, sorry, secular atheist white people, uh, what they consider their moral system, a lot of this, you know, secular humanism bullshit (laughs) is uh, actually just, you know, the same Christian morals that we've always had, just justified in a different way. Like, they still think that, you know, killing is wrong, stealing is wrong, adultery is wrong, all, all of these things, you know, maybe not as severely as a practicing Christian does, but they say the base morality uh, for the most part, is, sim- is there for the average person. I mean, then you have this, you know, sort of new age, postmodern, nihilist, atheist. It's like a totally different thing. But like your your casual agnostic <laughs> who like doesn't really consider problems of religion, but still doesn't really go to church. They still are following a basic Christian morality to a high degree. So uh, to <laughs> to go back to the main point, you can't really separate Christian identity from white identity fully 100 percent uh they are both very important things and so to get back so how, how do we move forward as a country well we embrace that identity so we we say this is a uh, historically white christian country and if you can't get behind that then you need to leave <laughs> i guess that sounds bad but no it's not like you know we are not going to you know, uh, deport people, we're not going to persecute or, uh, you know, round up people, but we're going to say, yes, race is real, and yes, uh, because of that, you're going to see a larger percentage of the ruling class be white. But that's okay, because that's how our meritocratic system of values is going to work. And we are going to give you the opportunity to live in our great, successful country, this country that has, uh, you know, a very high standard of living. We are not going to expel you, but you need to be on board with that program. You need to uh, be pro-white, even if you are not white. Uh, Does that make sense? So imagine if I... 
you know, as a white person, went to Japan, and uh, I started saying, well, actually, Japan uh, should be a, a multiracial country, and I think that these white people in Japan should have uh, equal say in everything and equal representation based on the proportion of our population. I think Japan would probably find that pretty ridiculous. They'd say, no, this is a historically <laughs> Japanese nation. We have no reason to cater to you. You came into our country, and uh, you can participate in this high Japanese standard of living, or you can just leave. <laughs> We're not going to uh, sit around and let you shit on Japanese people. And I think, you know, America needs to act the exact same way, right? We're not going to sit around and let you shit on white people. We're going to have strong civil rights for white people. We, we, we need to attack, you know, anti-white hate speech. We need to vehemently attack things like, uh, you know, critical race theory in schools. And if we can sort of change the culture towards this pro-white and and be unabashedly pro-white, like use that word, because there really shouldn't be anything wrong with saying pro-white. Uh, it should be no different than saying pro-black or pro-Latino or any of these things. Uh, and uh, if we can change the messaging and the signaling surrounding that and say, hey, as long as we're on board with this and we don't uh, buy into this oppression narrative and we actually do, do believe in race realism to a certain degree, uh, we can all live in harmony and accept this high standard of living as long as you get with the program don't keep blaming racism and white supremacy we can live as a multiracial nation and uh, I think you know you can have some kind of alternative uh, way to talk about this I, like white supremacy just sounds bad because this is not white supremacy in the same way that if you're uh, uh, if you believe in patriarchy, does that make you a misogynist? Um, no, you don't hate women. You just understand that there's a difference between men and women, and therefore, it, it makes more sense for men to take this uh, leading role in society. If you're a race realist, <laughs> does that make you a white supremacist? Do you believe that uh, white people are superior in every way? No, but it means that you recognize that. There are differences between races, just like how there's differences between men and women. And if we operate on a purely meritocratic system, it is going to be better off for everybody if more white people are in these positions of power, right? Just based on how we've seen the results of, you know, white versus uh, non-white countries and their trajectory throughout history. Uh, and that should not be a problem, and it, it should not be something that is so controversial to say. I mean, this is the truth. So if you are a person concerned with the truth, if you are a Christian, the, the truth should be your uh, primary uh, pursuit. So we can't just deny the truth. We have to understand that these differences exist in the same way that it might be politically expedient to say that men and women are equal and women do belong in the workforce and all of these things, but it's frankly an untruth. If you're a Christian, you cannot put up with that because it, it's it's a lie. <laughs> Men and women are not the same. They do not have the same uh, capacities. That's not to say that outliers don't exist uh, in the same way that obviously racial outliers still exist. There's plenty of highly intelligent, even genius level uh, black people, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be uh, occurring at the same rate as, you know, a white genius, right? And that shouldn't be controversial to say, that should just be the truth. And so we have to move away from terms like white supremacy, as well as terms like white nationalism. You're not going to create a, a white ethnostate in a political fashion. It's just not going to happen. And that's one thing I do agree with the, you know, the, the BPFs, uh, uh, their side about it is, not going to happen. You need to accept some kind of multiracial future, but I believe this is the only way a multi -fu multiracial future works, uh, because otherwise you're going to still have these racial tensions. They're not going to go away as long as one group is underrepresented and one group is supposedly overrepresented. There's really no way to reconcile that unless you are, you know, totally brutally honest and say, no, this is the truth, this is the uh, studies, this is the statistics, and 
this is a country with a very high standard of living. We would like to keep the standard of living. We'll still let you live here. Uh, you just can't take down that standard of living. You have to get with the program. You need to be uh, pro-white, pro-Christian, uh, European history and understand that that is the history of the country and uh, get behind it. And I think a good word for this, we could use something like white primacy. So uh, this white European Christian culture is going to take primacy over other cultures because that is the history of our country. This is, you know, American national identity is another thing. It cannot be separated away from uh, a white Christian identity. So uh, all of these things they go hand in hand and if we uh, are very blunt about this and very truthful going forward I think that's the only viable alternative to uh, this pure you know white nationalism versus this pure race denial and uh, I'm interested to hear people's thoughts on that and and if they think that uh, either of this, those two options are actually somehow more viable than the option that I'm presenting of this sort of uh, middle ground going forward.